Definitely looking forward to what he has to say tonight. His topic is Our Great God and Father. We're going to have an opening song. Steve Watson will lead us in that. And then we'll have an opening prayer by Doug Deaton. And then we'll turn it over to Mark. Number 660. 660. Let's sing all four verses and then the chorus. We'll, we'll sing the chorus at, at, after all four verses. There is a habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who seek that grand abode a city with foundations firm as the eternal throne no wars or desolation shall ever move a stone no night is there no sorrow no death and no decay, no yesterday, no morrow, but one eternal day. Within its pearly portals, angelic armies sing with glorified immortals. The praises of its King. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Let us pray. Dear God, we come before your throne praising your name. We know of your might and your glory. Pray that you'll help us to always remember this. Pray that you'll always to help us remember your position with respect to ours. I pray that you'll help us to look to your word for guidance. Pray be with us tonight as we open your word. Pray that you'll help us to put your word into our hearts and be more like you each day. But most of all, we thank Thee for the love that You so richly showered down upon us so that one day we could have a home in heaven with You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. I hope that your day has been as good as my day. Has anybody here not had a good day? Well, that looks good. All right. All good. I'm proud of that. Well, just God bless you this evening. So proud to be here with you tonight. Uh, so good to see so many that we know here at this congregation, friends and uh, acquaintances, and it's just so good to see so, so many of that. Love and appreciate your preachers and uh, your elders, and it's just so good to, to be back over in this area. Bring you greetings from the Austinville congregation in Decatur, and they send their greetings and their love as well as their kindness. Proud to have my wife and daughter with me this evening. They don't always get to go. It's, in fact, very seldom that they get to go. And when they do get to go with me, that is a, a special, special... Well, we love our kids, don't we? My, we love our kids. I love mine. Appreciate... I always... I kind of kind of brag about them every now and then. You know, my son is in Buford, Georgia, working with the Buford Church of Christ. And enjoying enjoying that and proud that he's a preacher and uh, uh, my daughter kind of kind of brag about this she works for coach Nick Saban and so we kind of have a, a nice connection there and you know enjoy some of those perks every now and then so <laughs> that's a good thing but we love and appreciate our families and thank God for you and your families this evening just God bless you but tonight we're talking about something that's most important and that is our great God he is our Father. Many passages in God's Word that relate that to us. It's just not a, an abstract construct that we have 
just grasp out of the air and assimilate it into our understanding and knowledge, but rather it is a very important principle, a principle communicated to us by God and through His Son, through the Holy Word, and that is a great principle for us to consider. I'm sure that you can relate to a number of principles and passages that contain the concept of the greatness of God and the reason we are to give Him the, the adoration, the praise, the honor, the glory that He deserves. Think about the words of Jesus in Matthew 5 when Jesus said very clearly, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, giving God the glory. Now, that's a great principle there. I think about what Paul said in Romans chapter 11. When he began in verse number 33, and he said this, he said, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, the, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He goes on to talk about the, the, the depth and the height and the things that are through him and by him and to him, and all things to him are to be glory forever. There it talks about the glory. Ephesians chapter 3, the last two verses of that great chapter, uh, talks about the, the blessings and the benefits of being his love, in his love and care unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And then it says, Unto him be glory in the church by, by Christ Jesus throughout, world, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. There unto him be glory, our great God. And then you think about Ephesians chapter 4 where we're told in that great section of Scripture 1 through 6, but especially verses 4, 5, and 6, that there is one Spirit and one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, that is a, above all, through all, and in you all. There are the great concepts of God and how great He truly is. Now this evening I want us to think about just these concepts of greatness when we consider God, but as we think about them, we can consider just the qualities and the characteristics of God that will help us to understand and acknowledge Him in a much fuller fashion. Uh, we think about that God is great. He is from everlasting to everlasting, Moses said in the 90th Psalm in verse number 2. In that great beginning verse of the Bible, Genesis 1 and verse 1, He is acknowledged John 1, verse 1, he is acknowledged. Hebrews 1, verse 1, he is again acknowledged as being the great and wonderful and true God. Other passages relate the same thing. We see the love of God in Ephesians 3. We see the peace of God in Philippians 4. And so we see all of these concepts of God. I was reading in the book of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, just the other day. And I read there in 29 in verse number 13 of 1 Chronicles that we should thank God him and praise him because his name is glorious. There is the great and wonderful God. Exodus 15, when the nation of Israel came out of Egyptian bondage, they walked across the divided sea on dry land, and then they came to the opposite side of that great, that great ocean, that great body of water. Exodus 15 records the celebration of they say, God is a man of war. He has delivered us and he has, he has killed and ruined our captives. There in Exodus chapter 15 and verse number 2, Moses sang the song entitled, I Will Exalt Him. And that is a great principle. When we think about the concept of God, we have God in a number of ways. We have Him in the fact that we will glorify Him here on this earth. We know that we can come to know Him in a number of areas. We know Him through creation. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. Psalm 19 and verse 1, there the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. We come to know Him through Scripture and how important it is in regard to that. John 5 verse 39, what God is doing, what He is like, what He has done, and what He will do is all contained in that passage. Read sometimes Psalm 139, and there see the omniscience, the omnipotence, and the omnibenevolence of God, that He is self-contained in every conceivable fashion. 
And yet when we think about God, we think about Him in a number of ways, but in a personal way, that's what I want us to consider this evening. I think about it in a personal way, we think about God as the God of the second chance. Jonah ran from God. You know, whenever we run from God, doesn't Satan always have the boat waiting? And he paid the fare and he rode in the boat. Well, we, we know the process of time when he was swallowed by the great fish and then as he spent three days and three nights vacation in the belly of that great, great seafaring monster and then he was finally vomited out onto the ground. And there in Genesis 3, uh, or rather Jonah 3 and verse number 1, it said the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time. Thank God that he is the God of the second chance. Was it the prodigal son? who returned and he said, Father, I'm no worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. And we see that he was received with welcome and open arms. He received a second chance. Folks, if you're living, and you are, and you're living for the Lord, you've experienced the second chances that God has granted unto you. He's the God of the second chance, but he's also the God of the fourth generation. Genesis 15 gives a prophecy concerning the nation of Israel. They would go down into Egypt, there be captive, and for 400 years they would remain as the slaves of Pharaoh. But in the fourth generation, God would emancipate that great people, and he did. But it was in the fourth generation that he remembered them and brought them out. He's not only the God of the second chance and the fourth generation, he's the God of the fifth sparrow. Remember the passages in Matthew chapter 4, and, or rather Matthew 10 and verse number 29, where it describes that uh, two sparrows are sold for a farthing, four sparrows are sold for two farthings, but then you come over to Luke 12 and verse number 5, 12, 5 and 6, and there we see that five sparrows are sold for two farthings. One sparrow is thrown in, to boot. He's the God of the fifth sparrow. He cares for me. When the days are weary, the long, light, long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. And thank God for that. He's the God of the eleventh hour. Matthew 20 describes workers in a uh, agricultural setting. Some had been hired at the beginning of the day, some throughout the period of the day, some even at the end of the day, but when it came to time, when it came to pay time, how much was each individual worker paid? He was paid the very same amount as all the others. Whether he had worked all day or just the last hour. He's the God of the eleventh hour. He's even the God of a thousand hills. Psalm 50 in verse number 10 talks about that uh, there's a, a thousand hills and they're covered with cattle. I like that. I'm a cattle farmer and I can, I can see a thousand hills out there covered with all of these mama cows, all of the calves, getting them ready to wean and send to sale. I can see that and I appreciate that. These are the things that we speak about when we consider just how wonderful and great God is. But now for the next few moments, I want you to consider some reasons why we should give God our glory because of his greatness. Now go back in your Bible, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3 in verses 20 and 21, and that's where I want us to work from this evening. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, just to consider some principles that will help us to understand just how great God is and what he has done for us and the reason that we should in turn glorify his name. Go back to that passage and let's read it once again and consider the principles that are contained therein and the principles that we can glean from other parts of Scripture. And we'll see just how blessed this truly passage really is. Paul said there, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory and the church by Christ Jesus. He says, Throughout all ages, world without end, amen. These two passages serve as a transitional section of scripture from the first, three tra the first three chapters of Ephesians and the last chapters of Ephesians. Chapters 1 through 3, Paul has been talking about doctrinal issues. Now he changes and he now takes a look at the practical applications. How do you live out these doctrines that you find in chapters 1 through 3? And he tells about that in chapters 4, 5, and six. In fact, when you look back in chapters 1, 2, and 3, there we see the great principles concerning the blessings that we have in God. Notice in chapter 1 and verse number 3, 
Notice it says there, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That verse tells us that we've been blessed. The word blessed is a very beautiful word. It comes from the Greek word, euligo, or we get the English word, if you're not really interested in Greek, we get the English word eulogy. When's the last time you went to a funeral? Well, the individual that maybe said some words, spoke some sayings, gave some principles at that funeral, they delivered what was called a eulogy because the word eulogy simply means good words or speaking good words. So Paul says here two times in verse number 3, blessed, and there's the word eulogy, Good words, good things. We're blessed with good things. Blessed be the, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed. He's done good things to us. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so therefore it's saying here that God has been good to us and truly we understand that without, without confusion. Think for just a minute, folks how truly blessed we are to to be able to do what we're doing right now in the capacity in which we're able to do it, in the geographic location, in the comfort. Folks, let me tell you this, uh, and I think you probably understand it, but let me remind you of it. As one little fellow said, we ain't got no reason to complain. We've got good jobs. We have plenty of money. I see from looking at every one of us that we're not starving. We entertain ourselves and we go where we want to go, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. We have families and friends and acquaintances and people to lift us up when we're down and to carry us through when we're, when we're happy. We have, folks, just let, let's face it, we've got it all, do we not? We don't have a reason under the sun to ever complain. Now where did every bit of this come from? Who are the one, who is the one that we can trace every bit of this back to? It's God. And Paul is reminding these Ephesians. He said, you're the richest folks on the face of this earth and the reason that you're rich, he says, you're in Christ. And because you're in Christ, He has blessed you with, with blessings to abound. He's opened the floodgates of heaven and, and flooded you with blessings to the point you can't even comprehend. You can't think or ask in such a great fashion that would ever match what He has done for you. And then He lists them. Look in chapter 1, verse 7 in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Look in chapter 1, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Look in chapter 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Look in chapter 3, verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Look in chapter 3, verse 16. That he might grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. And then we find verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You see, folks, there is a thread running through chapters 1 through 3, and that thread is saying, folks, in Christ you are rich. And no wonder he draws the transitional passage to a point, to a climax, when he says, because you are rich, then give the one that has granted you the riches the glory. And he says, unto him be glory. Now, with that context, think about th three or four reasons tonight why we should give God the glory that He deserves. Number one, we need to give God the glory because God has settled our largest debt. Our largest 
debt. There were three, cro three crosses that owned the crest of Calvary many years ago. One cross, it was the cross of rebellion. That man, he died in sin. Another cross was the cross of repentance. That man, he died to sin. That is, he died and left it. And there was a third cross, and it was the cross of redemption. And that man died for sin. God has settled our largest debt. You see, the Bible says, and I believe that you're the, the kind of people that could be said, uh, you're the Bible-quoting, Bible-toting kind of people. For the Bible tells us just how terrible sin is because the Bible says very clearly that the wages of sin is what? You know it. Death. The penalty for sinning is death. Now, folks, that kind of penalty, the severity of that penalty is found nowhere else on the face of this earth except in regard to our relationship with God. You go out here on the highway, get out here on 565 or Get out here on the road. I don't know exactly what the speed limit is, but I believe there it's about 65 going towards Scottsboro. You, you, you take off on that highway going lickety-split, and you pull it up to 110, and you have a policeman stop you, and they'll write you a ticket. But I guarantee you I've never heard them. There might have been, but I've never heard of someone getting the death penalty for speeding. Just the other day, a young man, he took some things out of J.C. Penney outlet in Decatur, and he didn't pay for it. But they're not going to kill him for it. You see, our civil laws, they're graded. God's law is absolute. You sin, and what's the penalty? Death. But you see... The verses there in Romans chapter 3 that tell us so explicitly about that verse, the, the fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we understand that. Satan's led us all down the wrong road. The very next verse tells us in Romans 3 verse 24, being justified freely by, by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, we've been justified freely. How? By His grace. And I'm so proud that we can sing that Jesus paid it all. For, for when He paid it all, He paid every, every bit for all of our sin. You see, I should have been the one on that cross because I'm the one that sinned. But God put His Son there in my place. And he settled my largest debt. Unto him be glory. But not only did he do that, but, but I also think about the fact that God has satisfied my deepest need. I'm here to tell you this evening that when we read there in verses one and, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 7 about the redemption that is through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace, that speaks of a universal problem that affects every individual on the face of this earth. That, that you and I here tonight have the same, the same greatest problem as the folks over in Decatur and back in Hamilton and down in Birmingham and Tuscaloosa and Montgomery and every state in this, in this wonderful country and every place around the face of this earth. Every one of us has the same problem and it's our biggest problem. And folks, our biggest problem is sin. And if our biggest problem is sin, that tells us that we have a great need. Because if we all share the same problem, we all have the great need. And the greatest need that you and I have on the face of this earth is the forgiveness of sin. And here in this verse, chapter 1, verse 7 of Ephesians, we're told that God has provided that for us. In other words, God has He satisfied my deepest need. 
You know, you think about just how wonderful God's Word truly is. I read about those verses, and we read about them in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul, in a very explicit way, he begins in verse number 12 and saying this, he said, All the will of godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He said, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He said, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, completely furnished unto every good work. What a blessing we have in the provision of God's Word. But he doesn't stop there. Because then he gives the practical application. Chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee, Timothy, therefore before the Lord and and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead that is appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. You see, Judaism was a seasonal religion. And you you either did it in its season or you didn't do it. Paul is telling him, that is Timothy, don't wait around for the season for a Jewish activity. You be ready and active every day of your life in preaching the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. He said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll turn away from the truth. They'll turn unto fables. And then he says down in verse 6, he said, He said, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished the, finished the course of kept the faith. Henceforth there is. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day. And not unto me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. See, that's the great blessing when we consider the fact that our number one need has been met. We can live a satisfied life. Unto Him be glory for that. Thirdly, I want you to consider not only, first of all, that God has settled our largest debt, He has provided for us forgiveness in the sacrifice of His Son. That entails, number two, that God has he satisfied our deepest need. That is for forgiveness because that's our number one need and, and he's satisfied and dealt with the number one problem that plagues us all. But number three, I want you to notice that God has provided for our greatest desire. I believe the universal desire of everyone is for guidance. We spend our life as parents teaching our children just exactly how to live, don't we? Grandparents, they keep on telling, now this is what you need to do and this is how you need to do it. We're constantly we're being told or we're telling how to do things, when to do them, why to do them. We're, we're full of guidance. And we understand the importance of all of that. Back here in chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4, I want you to notice in Ephesians, Paul said in verse number 1 of chapter 3, For this cause I, Paul, he said, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to you, uh, to you. And then in verse 3 he says, How that by revelation he made known unto you the mystery. And then the parenthetical explanation. He says, As I, as I wrote aforetime in few words, whereby when you read you may know and understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Folks, you see at one time... The, the, the plan of God was held as a mystery. That, that, that is, it was, it was self-contained. It was, it was puzz- not completely revealed. But you see, when a mystery is made known, it ceases being a mystery because when a mystery is made, well, made known, then it becomes a revelation. And Paul is saying, you have been blessed with a revelation of God's will And it's been personified in the life of His Son, Jesus Christ. There's no excuse then, he's saying. Remember what Peter said? Christ also suffered for us, 
leaving us an example that we should follow in his what? I heard you say it, his steps. Thank God for that. James 1.16 begins by saying this, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Folks, this evening I remind you of the fact that everything that is good and perfect in your life you can trace back and find as the origin in God. And He's never going to stop, let up, or waver in giving you those good and perfect gifts. You see, there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning in his giving. The word variable there is an interesting word. I was speaking with one of the engineers that works at the Browns Ferry Nuclear Plant that attends the Austable Congregation, and I, I said, just give me some information concerning the word vary or variation. I said, in your kind of work, I imagine that things need to be precise. <laughs> As you're there and you're working, uh, is there a, a margin of error, a plus or minus, on the, the gauges or the dials or the, the readouts that he said, he said, in my kind of work, he said, there is no room for error. We can't have any variation. Can't go a little to the left or a little to the right. Can't be a little plus or a little minus. He said it has to be top dead center. See, that's the kind of way the God that gives, that, that's, that's how God gives to us. He doesn't let up one day and, and, and strengthen it up tomorrow. He doesn't back off today and then speed up the next day. He is a constant, steady stream of those things that are good and perfect in our life, and He's giving them to us. There's not even a shadow of His turning. Turning is the real thing. And turning will cast a shadow, just like a tree. It'll cast a shadow. And you know, when you see the shadow, that's not the real thing, but, but the real thing exists. You just got to keep looking. He's saying here, there's not even a doubt, a shadow of a doubt, that God will turn from giving to us. Now, the question is, what has he given to us according to James chapter 1? Continue on in the passage there. Uh, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And be a hearer of the word, and not a doer. He's likening to a man that beholdeth himself and then look at the way, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Verse 25 says, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seemeth to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, now folks, in, in verses 18 and following through the end of the chapter, James is not talking about we, we've got two ears and one mouth so we need to speak less and hear more <laughs> in our conversations with others. No, that's not what he's talking about. Oftentimes people have equated that. What he's talking about when he says be swift to hear and slow to speak, he's saying be swift to hear the Word of God and slow to speak out against it. He's talking about being doers of the Word not just a hearer, looking into the perfect law of liberty and continuing therein. And then he equates the doing, the listening, the living, the faithful child of God as someone who has control over their tongue. I'll not ask you to raise your hands, but is there anybody here that's ever lost control of your tongue at one time in your life? And I'll be the first one to raise both hands. <laughs> Because you see, folks, if I try to control my tongue by myself, I can't do it. I need the lamp to my feet and the light to my path to be the controlling agent in my existence. Because he talks in verse number 27 about pure religion. 
pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted by the world. The little word visit in that passage, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, the word visit comes from the very same Greek word from which we get a very interesting word in our English language and the Bible because the, the word visit there is the same word that we get the word elder. It's the word episkopos. It's amazing how there in that passage the Christian is to take on elder qualities in caring for others. You see how the Word of God guides us? God has provided for our greatest desire, and that is guidance. Unto Him be glory. Lastly, number four. God is prepared for our highest longing, and that is heaven. Throughout every one of these passages... We see the reference to heaven. I look back in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, and it talks about that the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. An inheritance. Now that's not a physical inheritance, that's a spiritual inheritance. It's heaven. I was thinking just the other day about reasons why I wanted to go to heaven. I thought of several. I thought, first of all, I want to go to heaven because I've been invited. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus said. Of all the invitations of all the people of the world, the kings and presidents and monarchs and dictators and and the great personalities of the world that might invite us to participate with them in something, there's no invitation like the invitation to heaven. Let's accept that invitation. Secondly, I want to go to heaven because heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Prepare to meet thy Lord, Amos 4 verse 12. We've got to be prepared like the, the five wise virgins because the five foolish We're unprepared. Oh, how preparation is such a blessing. And I'm convinced, as you know well, that preparing for heaven here on earth brings the greatest joy from day to day to live for the Lord. I guess the third reason is one of the most important, and that is heaven is appealing because of the understanding. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3, tells us about the fact that there are some things here on this earth that we don't yet understand. But it says, but when he doth appear, then we shall, that is, we shall gain some knowledge, know some things, be compared and be like. Can't help but believe that 1 John 3 is, is the passage from which the song that we sing was extrapolated from, and I'm, help me with the words, if you will. Farther along, we'll know, uh, know all about it. Is that what it? Farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll, you know that song, we'll understand why. I love to read and sing that, that song because it tells me on down yonder, there are things that I will understand that, folks, I just don't get right now. I don't understand why a mother gives, giving birth to a child dies when that child needs her the most. I don't understand that. Don't understand why a father coming home from work meets four headlights instead of two and he's ushered out into eternity when his family needs. I was preaching in a meeting down at the Farley congregation a few years ago, and a friend of mine from Arab came up and he carried a baby in his hand. And he said, Mark, he said, and I could tell that there was some birth defect, something that was less than normal. And he said, Mark, why did this have to happen to my child? I said, Joe, I don't know. 
I don't understand some things right now, but but down yonder we'll know all about it and we'll understand why. Tomorrow I'll go to Hateville and, and help preach a funeral. And I'm sure that you've lost loved ones, whether far, or near, late, or, or long. And many times those folks are close to us. But the more funerals I do and the more people I lose that die in the Lord, folks, heaven is becoming more appealing with every passing day. And God has provided for you and I to be with all of the redeemed for a time that is called, that I don't even understand the beginning or the end or all of the involvement in that word, eternity. And I wonder how I can thank Him. I wonder how I can show my appreciation And Paul says in Ephesians 3 verse 20 there, give him glory. Glorify his name. Unto him be glory. And I do it in the words that I speak, in the thoughts, and in the deeds. And I let my light shine. What a great God we serve. What an awesome God we have. And thank God for Him. Thank God for you this evening. We'll be back in just a minute for the invitation, and we'll see you in just a second. God bless you this evening.